Good afternoon and welcome to the OR Today webinar series. We're excited to have over 670 registered attendees for today's webinar. I want to remind you today's webinar is eligible for one continuing education hour and the post webinar survey and certificate process, which is automated. So the survey link will be included in the follow up email, which you'll receive about an hour after the webinar is finished. Once you've completed the survey, you'll be able to download your certificate immediately. Okay, let's kick off today's webinar by giving an OR Today Live surprise pack to the attendee that can tell me the answer to the following trivia question. This year, the World Health Organization is celebrating the year of the nurse, as well as honoring the 200th birthday of which British nurse, also known as the lady with the lamp? Answer now using the questions feature on your dashboard. While you're answering, I just want to remind everyone that if you've missed any of our previous OR webinars, you can watch them on our website, ortoday.com. Just click on the webinar tab um, and you can still receive a continuing education credit as well. Okay, let's see who is, is our winner. And we have uh, Adele Cool. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Of course, the correct answer is Florence Nightingale. Um, we'd also like you to help us celebrate the year of the nurse by sharing a standout story about you or a nurse in your life. Each submission will be entered to win a $25 Bath and Body Works gift card. So visit ortoday.com forward slash contest to enter. Okay, uh, OR Today would like to thank our sponsor, Rep Scrubs, Rep Scrubs, sorry. Rep Scrubs offers vendor management and cost reduction solutions. The Rep Scrubs program provides assurance that every vendor entering a sterile department is wearing clean, prepackaged, disposable polyproline scrubs dispensed on site while shifting the expense of providing those scrubs back to the vendor. For more information, visit repscrubs.com. Our presenter today is Dr. John Kutz, a medical advisor at Rep Scrubs. John, you may begin whenever you're ready. Thank you, Linda. Good afternoon, everybody. Thrilled to have you with us and thrilled to be here with you today. Uh, certainly, our world for the last several weeks has been turned upside down from what we typically know and understand. And we're going to talk a little bit about it today. And how we can change things potentially going forward. So in the past, we have, uh, I have, excuse me, done several webinars and the main focus of each of them really has been how we can unknowingly bring bacteria, viruses, pathogens in and out of our hospital environment without even knowing it. And I think that really is what's happening around the world now is that this virus has been transmitted without people even knowing that it's been happening. And in the past, we've talked about that. Uh, in OR Food for Thought, literally, that webinar was devoted to bringing material in and out of the operating room and what's on it, what pathogens are on it, and how could that impact the function of our operating room and contribute potentially to infections. What's coming home with your scrubs was similar in that we really talked about leaving the OR in the scrub attire that you wore all day and what impact that has on your family and society. And then on, on, in the webinar, are street scrubs contaminating your OR? Our focus of that was people coming into your OR in what we call street scrubs, meaning they have them at home, put them on, got in their car, came to the hospital, walked straight from their car into your OR potentially with those scrubs. And in each one of those webinars, I think we highlighted how the process of transmission of pathogens can occur unknowingly. And you know, the last one, which was OR Food for Thought, I, that highlighted what happens, I think, in almost every OR, which is people bring stuff into the OR. They bring bags, cameras, computers, cell phones, uh, all kinds of stuff. And, and in that webinar, I highlighted how all of that stuff was found to be contaminated with multiple pathogens and how that can impact patient care. So in the past, you know, we've kind of discussed this. You know, our mission at Rep Scrubs has always been, really, it doesn't matter who wears the scrubs. I mean, our goal is to protect the patient and public from pathogens, specifically microbiologic pathogens. And you know, our the purpose of our vendor management attire really applies to vendors who come into the operating room 
our purpose is to have them change into our scrubs before they enter the operating room environment. But it doesn't necessarily limit who can wear those scrubs. And I think that's important to highlight. You know, in, in the perfect world, I always say it would be great if everybody wore our scrubs. That way it'd be single use attire and we could control that environment a lot more closely. Although the folks in the OR come in in street clothes and change into OR attire when they get there. So there, it's a little bit different there. You know, Dr. Adams, the Surgeon General, has been on television multiple, multiple times. We've all seen him. And right out of the gate, he said, look, the way you stop the spread of an infectious disease like this is with mitigation measures and preventing people from getting it in the first place. And I think that highlights what we've talked about in the past, which is really the way to stop a process like this, whether it be with surgical site infections or people bringing things into your OR, or the spread of the coronavirus is to stop it in the beginning, literally nip it in the bud. And one of the ways are mitigation measures. And we've seen with the coronavirus that the, you know, the hallmark of mitigation measures has been social distancing, which appears to be working based on the current numbers and projections. And in the operating room, the mitigation measures we would highlight would be watching carefully what comes in and out of our operating room in so many arenas, whether it be scrub attire, whether it be a purse, whether it be a camera bag or a cell phone. So I think this is an important quote from the Surgeon General and applies not just to the coronavirus pandemic, but really to controlling infection in our operating room. You know, our vendor attire was developed to reduce the risk of microtransmission related to vendor traffic. That was the whole purpose, it was really to take that out of the equation so that the vendors could come in, change into our attire. And at that point, we knew we would have that component of potential unknowing transmission controlled. I put two blue arrows there because although our vendor attire is the highlight of our product line, we also make lab coats and coveralls. And I think we all have seen in the last few weeks how personal protective equipment has really highlighted some of these items, particularly lab coats and coveralls, and that they can be an important measure, not just in the operating room, but throughout the hospital as nurses, staff, therapists, dietary folks care for these patients. A coverall or a lab coat that's single use could provide them an immeasurable amount of protection. This was, we discussed this in a previous webinar on what's coming home on your scrubs. I love medical history, so I had to put this picture in. We all know that this pandemic has been compared on multiple scales to the, in, to the Spanish flu uh, pandemic in 1918. And if you look at the numbers for this, it's staggering, quite honestly. 500 million people infected worldwide, 50 million deaths, and 675,000 American lives lost. Now, I got these pictures from the CDC website, and you can see a bunch of nurses making masks, which is so similar to what we're going through right now. If you go back to the historical review of the pandemic in 1918, I think the social distancing wasn't really adhered to quite as much as we have now. Their ability to communicate, I think, was somewhat hampered in their ability to understand it also. And if you read how they addressed it, you can tell by the mortality curves that they had at that time. But I love this picture because, you know, as we have come out and said people should be wearing masks, this picture really was in 1918, 102 years ago, and look how similar it is to what we're doing today. I put these two pictures in to also illustrate on the left, you can see a pharmacist. Everybody is longing for some sort of pharmacologic way to treat this virus. And as so many of us know, viruses are really tricky. Treating them with any of our traditional methods can be a struggle. And oftentimes we provide supportive care to the patients until the virus has kind of run its course and the patient recovers. But the pharmacist, as you can see, they're an old time pharmacy, which they don't exist much anymore. 
So this guy is studying hard to figure out what he can put in that jar to concoct and maybe help people. On the right, this was a picture of a courtroom that they had passed a measure that said courtroom had to be held outside. So the social distancing here, if you look, really isn't quite what we're doing now. Um, they're well within six feet of one another. And this is what I said, I think their ability to understand the social distancing and the science behind the logic of that is, re is really difficult for them to understand. And you know, the six feet, which a lot of people say to me, what's the six feet? The six feet, as you most of us probably know, is the distance that the virus cannot safely travel. Under six feet, it's felt the virus potentially could travel and you could, at that point, have transmission. But over six feet, the virus doesn't seem to be capable of doing that. That's where that number kind of came in. By the way, the CDC website has all this information, and it's really fascinating to go and read about it. I had read about it as this started, and particularly how each city handled it. There wasn't this sort of federal mandate. Each city did their own thing. And you could see how their death rate and their survival rate really changed based upon how they addressed it. This is a map, as we have seen multiple times on all of our media platforms, of the coronavirus and where it's infected and how many it's infected. So obviously, the larger the red dot, the more infections that there are. And you can see this has kind of become a worldwide process. I mean, there are some areas that are isolated based, I suspect, largely on travel patterns. But if you go to most of the civilized world, you can see it really is everywhere. And you can see on a grand scale the incredible damage a microbe can do, right? So we talk about unknowing transmission and how it happens. If you think about how sophisticated our medical care is today, and how we've really kind of been brought to our knees and stopped solely based on this virus. It's really incredible if you think about it. Um, and you look at this map, the whole world has been changed by this virus in spite of everything we know, in spite of everything we've done, and in spite of everything we can do. So I wanted to link that to some of the things that we see in the operating room. So we, you know, we can see the impact that the coronavirus is having, and we can live how unknowing transmission occurs. But we see this all the time in the surgical world. And that's why I put the, you know, the potential of this, although surgical site infections aren't as grand a scale, the underlying premise is similar. It's almost metaphorical, honestly. And they can result in death, limb loss, disability, et cetera. And on here, we have MRSA, we have C. diff, we have VRE. And we, you know, those of us in the operating room environment see this in the hospital, see this all the time. I mean, patients get immersive VRE, C. diff. We know C. diff can be so easily transmitted from healthcare staff from patient to patient if they don't wash their hands with soap and water. Purell, we know, does not kill C. diff, but you need to wash for 20 seconds with soap and water. MRSA and VRE are incredibly um, resistant to some of our common methods. So we have to really be diligent in how they're spread. And we know MRSA can colonize almost ubiquitously patients in the hospital. So a colonization and an active infection are a lot different, but we know that these bacteria are floating around all the time and threaten our patients and can come in and out of what we consider to be our sterile environments routinely. Simply by things, as I mentioned in the past, in OR food for thought, literally, you know, a camera bag or, or a purse or your cell phone, computers, food. You know, I've had surgeons bring food into my OR and then get mad when I ask them to take the food out. So, you know, we can bring all these bacteria into our operating room and contribute to this process unknowingly, similar to how the pandemic of coronavirus has spread worldwide. So, I think these are two metaphorical concepts. Although the scales are different, I think it helps us understand how it happens. Because for some people, it's really hard to convince them that bringing your camera bag into the operating room, bringing your purse, bringing a computer, bringing your cell phone can contribute to a process so similar. A lot of folks are really resistant to understand that and really, really resistant to change behavior. And I'll be honest, I'll assume responsibility for it 
some of this really is the colleague behavior. A lot of surgeons have found it convenient, particularly in today's fast-paced world, to have their cell phone in the operating room, to have a laptop in the operating room, to have their camera in the operating room, to have a bag with all of their goodies in the operating room because they have to run from place to place. But we know that all that material can bring bacteria in the operating room, which can lead to surgical site infections, mortality, morbidity, and death. So although the scale with that versus the coronavirus pandemic are different, they're really the same premise. So, you know, our company, although yesterday, you know, if you go back to December and where we are today on April 9th, you know, things are a little bit different, but we have always been in the business of protecting the patient with personal protective equipment and security. And that's always been our number one goal. That's what the foundation of what we have strived to accomplish, which is, look, our goal is to protect the patient by mitigating the factors that potentially could result in a surgical site infection. And, you know, that if you go back to that slide, those three webinars in the past, that's the purpose of it all, really. And the Surgeon General has said that. Let's mitigate the factor. So a mitigating factor would be the personal protective equipment that we provide in all arenas, not just a vendor attire, but if you go back to the coveralls and the, and the jumpsuits, all of that stuff can help protect patients in multiple ways. And this unprecedented situation demonstrates how important proper attire is to prevent patient infection and microbe spread. I know all of us, every single one of us, can relay that experience where you see a staff member attempting to don that yellow gown and a mask and gloves as they enter a room of a patient with C. diff. The gown is almost universally not tied. If it's tied, it's not tied correctly. If it's on, it's ill-fitting or it doesn't cover everything. The mask may not be tied or the mask is done incorrectly. You see people go in all the time without masks, without gloves, and then they'll leave that room and go to take care of another patient. And the ability to unknowingly transmit whatever was in that room, whether it be VRE, C. diff, MRSA, can, can happen without us even thinking about it. And you know, for myself, I implant a lot of prosthetic material. So if I, my patient's in the ICU with a freshly implanted prosthesis, and my nurse, the nurse taking care of that patient is also taking care of a patient on a ventilator with C. diff or VRE. To me, I immediately demonstrate, and the nurses know, I immediately demonstrate concern because if you're going from the patient with VRE pneumonia, which is horrific, um, and then for the patient, you know, it's terrible. And then you go to my patient with a prosthetic, the ability to unknowingly transmit the VRE without any ill will on anyone's part is pretty high. So, you know, the personal protective equipment is so important and it's so critical that it be used. And particularly now we see this with patients being cared for with the coronavirus. So, and I want to qualify this by saying none of this that I'm going to talk about now are serve as universal guidelines for management of coronavirus. I, I don't want anybody to look at this slide or take a picture of it and say, hey, this is what, you know, Dr. Kutz told us to do. I, these are what is happening in our hospital and the things that we've come up with to help us control and mitigate these factors. I think a lot of this has come from the CDC, from the American College of Surgeons, from American uh, Association of Anesthesiologists, or ASA, American Association of Nurse Anesthetists, and multiple other organizations. Um, the first thing we have is a controlled entry. So everyone coming in and out of the hospital has to go through one single entry. It's, uh, for those of us who have been coming in and out of the hospital for years, we know we all have our secret little door that we go in, we kind of get our way and go about, but we can't do that now. So it's controlled entry through one port. Everyone's temperature is taken with a temporal thermometer to see if you have a fever. You know, when, before they had been utilizing kind of this self, um, you know, self-identification process, but sometimes that just doesn't work well, particularly when people are concerned about work and making money and their priorities may have been confused through no fault of their own based on the situation. So now everybody comes in a controlled entry Everyone's temperature is taken. If, you're to have a high, if your temperature is above 100.4, you go home. You can't come into work. Everybody has questioned. In my office, we ask everybody the same questions. Have you traveled to Europe? Have you been knowingly exposed to someone with coronavirus? 
do you have a fever or a cough? This helps us provide an in, this helps us provide an indication of whether they've been carefully screened, and if they have been, then we give them an indicator, which is usually a pass or some sort of sticker to wear, something that says, "Hey, I've been screened. I'm okay to walk around the hospital," um, and that's what the purpose of the controlled entry is. Now, emergency department entry is even more more constrained. So everyone coming in in the emergency room has to pass through a very controlled entry. It's an external entry, but it's protected, and they go through the same process. In the physician's offices, as I mentioned earlier, it's temperature and screening. You'd be surprised how many people still come to the office in spite of all this. And in the hospital, which is really the hard part, it's no visitation except for unusual and extreme circumstances. So that would be hospice, uh, birth or clinical deterioration and expected uh, anticipated demise. And I'll be honest with you, even now, those are really, really, really strict and it's not been happening too much. So it's strange to walk the halls of the hospital and see nobody. There's nobody. There's You don't see that many physicians. You certainly see no family. There are not as many patients. Um, and the staff is, you know, the staff is there, but the staff has been reduced. So that's what my hospital has done. It seems to have worked pretty well. And, a, and some of this really just occurred over the last 10 days as the ability to control this process uh, became much more stringent based on the anticipated surge of patients. So the operating room changes I've been intimately involved with, and a lot of this has been based on American College of Surgeon guidelines, the American Society of Anesthesia guidelines, American Association of Nurse Anesthesia guidelines. And for those of us in the operating room, we know that the anesthesia folks are the ones who get the closest to the patient's mouth and have really the highest risk of exposure. So we're gonna, we'll talk about that in a second, but we did dedicate a room that's specifically for COVID-19 patients, whether it be what we call a patient under investigation or a patient who has tested positive. That room now has a negative pressure uh, system in it, and all patients go to that room. Now, all of our other operating rooms, which I'm similar to you, which are, I'm sure are similar to you guys, are positive pressure, but in this room, it's a negative pressure ventilation situation. No elective cases. This has been the biggest struggle for me on a daily basis is that surgeons love to operate and telling them they can't operate has really been really hard. A lot of this came originally, the American College of Surgeons had posted guidelines about a month ago, maybe longer, but I'll, yeah, I'll use a month. And they kind of came out with this broad sweeping statement that said no elective cases, period. It was, it was kind of like that, but not quite so straightforward. I think they got a lot of pushback from surgeons saying, look, you know, someone with an enlarging abdominal aortic aneurysm, which is symptomatic, or somebody with symptomatic carotid stenosis having recurrent transient ischemic attacks, or somebody with progressive gangrene, or somebody with unstable angina, or someone with a large breast cancer, et cetera, those cases aren't really elective, they're kind of time sensitive. So what I had done at that point was said, time sensitive cases I can appreciate. So if it's someone with a large malignancy that has to have it resected or someone with a situation that has some time urgency to it, I let a lot of those cases continue. It did cut down our case volume significantly. But as you know, as things have gone forward, really for the last two weeks, it's been no elective cases at all. The American College of Surgeons put out a table that you can review for your specialty to determine what's elective because surgeons really have a hard time figuring that out. And in my operating room today, there were no cases. I did a case yesterday that was emergent, but today there were absolutely no operations. You know, the American College of Surgeons federal and state guidelines have said, look, no elective cases. Now, some of this, you know, from my own opinion, is based on resource management. So it's A, to, you know, maintain our personal protective equipment. Um, and B, it is to maintain our intensive care unit resources and nursing resources. So as patients, the volume of patients have increased and more need intensive care unit management, you know, continuing to do cases, particularly uh, in my hospital, which has a high acuity, continuing to do patients that have the potential need for intensive care unit management 
has been difficult. So we've really kind of said it's no elective cases. Anybody who wants to schedule a case has to really go through me, which has been time consuming and difficult, but it's something that we've done. Staff reduction, the staff uh, does, the staff um, wants to work. I mean, people want to work. This is what they're built for. They love the operating room. Um, they're being forced to do paid time off, mandated time off, vacation time. But those changes have prevented most people, I actually think prevented anyone from being uh, furloughed or laid off. Um, and it's frustrating, they wanna be working. They were thrilled that I actually had a case yesterday because everybody got to do something. But it's been really difficult for the staff. About two weeks ago, I had asked uh, all the staff to wear masks. I'd spoken to my hospital administration about it and I felt that all staff, whether they're in the room or not in the room, should be wearing masks, just a simple surgical mask for protection and to maintain social distancing within the department. I had kind of felt that was important uh, to protect the staff members as they continue to go about the workplace. And those of us who live in an operating room every day know that the thing that binds people together is, as I've mentioned in my last webinar, is the social engagement, it's the collegiality you eat together, you go to the cafeteria together, you go potentially a lot of times to the ICU with staff members because they want to follow up. And everybody is always together. So to tell people they had to wear a mask and practice social distancing was not met easily because I think a lot of people in the OR felt that maybe they weren't on the same plane because they were isolated from the rest of the patient population. But I thought it was important that the staff wear a mask and practice the social distancing. So, you know, as of 4-3-2020, which was just six days ago, um, I had suggested that only anesthesia be present in the patient's room for intubation and extubation and 20 minutes after each, meaning anesthesia would intubate and it would just be them for 20 minutes and extubate, it would just be them for 20 minutes. They would wear an N95 mask, a shield, and a gown. It, you know, that had come as a loose recommendation from the American College of Surgeons I like the concept behind it. The problem, there are two problems with it were, um, A, I was concerned that if anesthesia had any trouble, nobody could go in there and be an issue. Um, and B, it kind of left them out on a line. It just seemed that you know they were assuming all the risk. So you'll see in the next slide, a few changes have been made. I think I highlighted them. So, as of April 6, 2020, we still have the dedicated COVID room, no elective cases. But as I mentioned earlier, the mandate came down, only emergent procedures with immediate threat to life or limb. And I reviewed all those cases with certain. So immediate threat means impending threat. So ruptured aneurysm, acutely ischemic lower extremity, um, perforated bowel, uh, bleeding, um, food, food, we had a food bolus yesterday, uh, things of that nature, symptomatic cardioversion that, that um, they didn't want to do in the intensive care unit, stuff like that. But it, would, it has to be something that's immediate threat to life or limb. Staff reduction again, you know, all the staff wearing masks, the social distancing. Now, this is where we change things a little bit. Uh, the American Society of Anesthesia had changed their guidelines a little bit. So this is all staff in the room for intubation and extubation with complete PPE for 28 minutes. So, for example, yesterday when I finished my procedure, I sat in the corner in a chair for 28 minutes after the patient was extubated. Now, that time comes from a CDC formula that you can use to determine what the appropriate length should be based on the size of your room, the nature of the patient population, the type of airflow you have in your room, et cetera. And then you can take that and make your own formula. So some patients, I mean, excuse me, some hospitals based on the room size, it might be less time. So if you have a big um, or, a or a heart room or a transplant room that has a lot of space and more square footage, it might be more. If it's a small room, it might be less. Um, but no staff can enter for 28 minutes. So either you're in there when they intubate and then you stay, or when they extubate, you have to stay. So. That, and that's been a pretty strict rule. We put a sign up on the door and it says, cannot enter until this time, um, 28 minutes from when we intubate or extubate. And the staff has been really good about it. Um, nobody's really complained. People understand it, people get it. 
and they understand the, the premise, which is aeros aerosolization of the virus from that process. And I think I mentioned previously, anesthesia is completely protected. They have a sh almost like a welder shield, full PPE, gown, et cetera. I just did this slide before we came live, and I think this is relatively accurate. So there are 1 million, I'm sorry, that should be a comma there. It's my fault. So there's 1,506,936 cases worldwide. Um, I put that up there because that number is obviously incredibly large. We know that New York, New Jersey have been hit really, really hard with this. The other states, also as well, and New York being the epicenter. But it's, these numbers are staggering, and it's really difficult to accurately measure the number of MRSA, VRE, and C. diff cases, which cause surgical site infections, which lead to patient morbidity and mortality. But those numbers, if you look historically, continue to exponentially increase. And if you, and I don't, I'm not gonna go back to that first slide, but those three webinars, which we originally did, really focused on those, principles, which is that some of what we're unknowingly bringing into the opera room, without question, really has to impact this. Now, they've done multiple studies where people have said, look, it doesn't matter. But, you know, they can't do a double-blinded study, which I discussed in my last webinar, and say, look, everybody in that room has nothing come in. It's all clean and sterile. And everybody in this room is going to have people bring bags and phones and whatnot. And then we're going to see who gets infections. I mean, nobody would sign up for that study. Nobody would want to be a part of that. And it's almost not ethical. It really isn't ethical. But I think the coronavirus pandemic can illustrate and demonstrate to us how we unknowingly can bring things into our environment, which can impact patients, their well-being, and ultimately lead to death. Although the numbers for MRSA, VRE, and C. diff aren't as staggering as the coronavirus pandemic, they're still pretty significant. And they result in an enormous amount of healthcare dollars being spent to treat them. How can we improve for the future? I think anybody who's watched any of my prior webinars knows, and I've already mentioned, I love history. I love surgical history. So that photograph on the left is a guy by the name of Samuel Gross, and on the right is Dr. Agnew. Um, I train in Philadelphia, so these are both Philadelphia facilities. On the left, it's Jefferson. On the right is University of Pennsylvania. Um, and these both were painted by a guy by the name of Thomas Eakins. If you've watched my previous webinars, I've had these uh, paintings in there. Both of them are very famous paintings. The Gross Clinic on the left is an incredibly famous painting uh, and was sold by Jefferson for over $50 million many years ago. But uh, the point of putting these pictures up there isn't to talk about art history, uh, although we can. It really is to illustrate how different things are now than they were in 1875. You know, in eight, 1875 was when the Gross Clinic on the left was painted. And Sam Gross, I call him Sam as if I know him, Sam Gross is in a tuxedo, which he assuredly walked off the street into this operating theater, which we call pits. They were for educational purposes. They have tiered stadium seating. You can see everyone who's helping him has a tuxedo or a suit on. Uh, the OR back table, it looks like it's just a bunch of instruments thrown together. There's somebody doing a ledger in the back. No mask, no hat, nothing. And this is 1875. And one of the big issues for surgical management in those days is, as you can imagine, was infection. Now, if you go to the Agnew Clinic, which was 15 years later, you can see that it looks a little more professional, but still it really, it's almost as if they're in a big auditorium, which they really were. It was, a, it was a surgical pit. Everybody in the audience is watching. Uh, nobody has any personal protective equipment on. They have white attire on, which they thought looked more sterile and made them look more professional. But in reality, it didn't change anything. And this was a hallmark of surgical education for years. The, they still have a surgical pit at Jefferson, which was converted to a classroom environment. It's really a cool thing to see. But this was how people learned how to do things. You know, in this, if we all know we see these operating rooms, we have them all in our operating uh, theaters. Uh, you can see how complicated things are now. It's so different than when Sam Gross was operating in 1875. I mean, our operating rooms now are multi-million dollar adventures with complex equipment 
that provides incredible levels of care, which we've never ever been able to accomplish in the past. Our ability to intervene and change patients' lives has never been greater than it is now. And those operating rooms that I have pictured here do that. Um, you know, down in the lower left-hand corner, that's a hybrid operating room. You know, a room like that with all the software, that's a three to $4 million adventure. You see a robot up on the right. You know, these are incredibly intricate, complex equipment and machines. So it's really, these are special places, but it, it really highlights how different it is now compared to 1875. But in some ways, how similar, right? We have these complicated, incredibly special operating rooms, but if we're bringing in our bag from home that sat on the kitchen floor with the dog, um, as in my house, the dog will rub up against the bag to try and make it their bag. So you have that bag, which was on your kitchen floor, the dog was playing with it, and then you took it and put it in your car, then you dropped it in the office, then you walk into the operating room with it. I'm not sure how different that is than Sam Gross operating a tuxedo, really. You have this beautiful operating room, which looks so pristine and sterile and perfect, and then you bring something in from the outside. Aren't we really kind of doing the same thing? So how can we improve for the future? You know, I think I, I, I mentioned a little bit of it in the last slide, but I mean, I think we have to focus on the integrity of the patient care environment. You know, and operating room obviously is what we're all endeared to, but not just the operating room, the intensive care unit, the neonatal ICU, bone marrow transplant units, I mean, those are all special places where the ability to unknowingly transmit a, a pathogen, particularly a microbiologic pathogen to patients happens all the time, all day. So bags, purses, phones, computers, those are all things that really can contribute in a negative way to patients' well-being. And that's why I put that slide of 1875 in and the slide of the modern day operating room. Although the, although the appearance of the operating room has changed, some of our behavior really hasn't. So, you know, walking in your tuxedo may not be any different than walking in with your cell phone. Um, I think we have to utilize personal protective equipment when caring for patients with infectious organisms that can be transferred unknowingly. And that's what I mentioned earlier. You know, we've all been in the hospital. We see people through no fault of their own struggling, getting on the yellow gown, the mask, the hat, and they take it off and then they have to go to the next patient. I think you know the, it's important in this pandemic, I'm sure we'll highlight to people how important it is to practice really, really stringent patient hygiene and personal prote protective equipment use as we take care of patients. You know, the American College of Surgeons had put out a statement, you know, change your scrubs when they're visibly sold or after a known infectious case. I, I've seen a lot of my colleagues walking around in scrubs that have blood on from the first case and they're doing the third case. Um, it's mind boggling and I tell them to change, but you, we've seen it all the time. Or if you drain a, uh, an abscess and then you go into, say you drain a knee abscess and then you go in to do a total knee replacement, well, I think you should change scrubs between that, shouldn't you? I mean, how do you know, how do you know what's on your scrubs is not going to impact the total knee? You don't, you just don't. Uh, I think without question, you have to really mandate that vendors entering a procedural environment where distinguishing clean single-use attire. And the vendors are the, are the population in which they come from the outside all the time. I mean, the patient, patient excuse me, the, the personnel in the hospital, in the operating room, cath labs, bone marrow transplant units everywhere, they usually come in and street clothes and change into their scrubs if they're going to wear them. But the vendors, as I mentioned earlier, they have a tendency to walk right in. And I think if they're gonna come into the environment, we have to know that as they enter that arena, as they enter that area, I need to know that they are following strict patient care guidelines. And a patient care guideline is wearing clean single-use attire. Dr. Fauci, I read an article this morning, um, and I'm gonna highlight this, wash your hands before and after all patient contact. Um, he and I, Anybody who knows me knows I have an obsession with washing my hands. My family makes fun of me. My staff makes fun of me. In the OR, they make fun of me because I wash my hands before I scrub. Uh, <laughs> I have no, they say, why do you do that? I said, I don't know. It just seems right. So, I mean, Dr. Fauci has said, look, we have to wash our hands all the time. And he even said, and I read this article this morning, he said, look, the day of shaking hands with people 
as we have so cavalierly in the past may be over. Now, I don't know about that. And I didn't actually, I learned some history from that. I didn't know that shaking hands kind of came from the day where you know everybody in the Wild West had a gun. And if you shook somebody's hand to show you didn't have your gun or you weren't pulling your gun out. I'm not sure if that's true or not, so don't quote me on that. But it sounded pretty good when I read it. It was from Dr. Fauci. So we have to wash our hands incessantly, obsessively. And I think the last thing is we have to avoid complacency. We all have a tendency to fall into complacency. And I mentioned it in my last webinar. I've mentioned it in other webinars. You know, a lot of the vendors are our friends. I mean, one of my closest friends is a vendor for me. And we let those lines get blurry. If he comes in and I know he's running from one hospital to the next and he comes running down the hall and he has a, on his company scrub attire, you know, you might say, oh, I get it. You know, he's working hard. He, you know, he's running. It's okay. But in reality, it really isn't okay. And I think you have to set the standard. You have to be the person who says, look, I know you're running late. I'm sorry. Please stop. Turn around. Can you put on a clean pair of scrubs? It's not easy to do because we all let our guard down, but we can't. The complacency, whether it's donning the yellow gown, whether it's coming in and out of rooms, whether it's washing our hands, or whether it's coming into the OR, we really can't become complacent. I wanted to put this slide, and I was going to put it in the beginning, but uh, I put it at the end. You know, I think uh, you can't say enough, really, to all the people who have been doing their jobs all along for years and years and years. And to all those healthcare workers who come in every day, um, no matter what the situation, no matter what the circumstance, they're willing to go in, take care of the patients, and really put themselves at risk. And, you know, I admire those people who say, I'm gonna come and do that. that that's my job and that's what my passion is and I don't really care. Um, it's not that they don't care, but they're, they're diligent, they're focused, and they wanna help the people. And I think to all the healthcare workers, to the medical industrial representatives. Um, one of my uh, friends called me today, said one of those vendors had to go to a facility where the patient potentially had a uh, coronavirus. Everybody in the room had an N95 mask, but they wouldn't give one to the vendor. And the vendor said, well, I'm not coming in until you give me an N95 mask. I mean, I think rightfully so. Um, our first responders, our grocery store employees, the gas station attendants, truck drivers, food prep workers, therapists, you think of all the people who are out there every day getting in their car, going to work, knowing that they're on the front line of this incredible situation and this pandemic. I really think they deserve kudos and thanks. And uh, today when I was in the intensive care unit, it's, you know, it's incredible to see the morale of everybody is still high. People are thrilled to be at work and they're thrilled to be participating in the recovery of these patients. And that goes to the environmental services folks too. I mean, they're cleaning the hospital, it's brutal. It's difficult, it's stressful, but they're out there doing it and doing a great job. And I think really the kudos and the congratulations and all of the thank you has to go to everybody who's out there doing it every day. I wanna say thank you uh, for having me today. I know a lot of us uh, have a strange working environment now. Some people are at home, some people aren't having as busy a life as always, but thanks for allowing me to talk to you this afternoon. And if you have any questions, uh, please, feel free to ask. Thank you so much, John. Um, and of course, everybody here at OR today backs you up on everything you say on thanking the staff everywhere. Um, we've got quite a few questions, so I'll get straight into that. The, the first question is, what is the biggest challenge that you face in your facility with adjusting to the new norm? I think, um, I'm gonna answer this honestly, so don't anyone get upset with me. I think the, two challenge, the biggest challenge I have found in my personal has been with patients. Um, I have found that patients are taking this far more cavalierly than staff has been. So um, I, I found the patients to be a little bit of a challenge because I'm shocked at how many people are still coming to the office for what seemed to be routine visits. Now, we have been starting to do a lot of telehealth, which is fun. The patients actually really like this. Um, the patients enjoy it. And if they're savvy with the technology, you can really have a great visit. And you can't physically examine somebody, but if the patients are good with, the, with their iPad or their computer, you can get a pretty lot of stuff done. Um, I would think the second challenge uh, with, I, and this situation has been so dynamic, has been communication. I think 
communication and making sure everybody's in the loop to avoid fear because we all know if we don't understand something the fear becomes rampant so i think you know communication has been so important and i've been doing that with my staff i've been making sure everybody understands that in the areas that i help administrate and talking to other staff members and even patients um, to reinforce what the guidelines are to reinforce what we need to do to take away some of the fear uh, and to help people kind of move forward because there's a lot of as we all know there's a lot of speculation conjecture fear rumor and all kinds of stuff and if you take that out of the picture and just educate people you know you can really help put them at ease that's great. The next question is, uh, what are some creative measures that you're using to keep your staff calm in this crisis? I'm sorry, Linda, could you repeat that? Part of it broke up. My, my apologies. That's okay. Uh, what are some creative measures that you're using to keep your staff calm in this crisis? Well, <laughs> well um, one is I think you have to serve as a good, as, um, one of my scrub techs said to me yesterday, you have to be the example. Um, because I was, I'll was i admit, I will be the first one to say, I was antsy about the 28 minutes. I wanted to, part of me wanted to leave the room because you know, as we all know, that 28 minutes, you can do a lot of stuff, which is orders, um, communicate with family. Uh, and I really wasn't going to leave. I was just talking about leaving, but she said, you have to be the example. So I, you know, I, I was the example. I didn't, I sat in the corner talked to the staff, we um, had a nice conversation. And I think it helped everybody kind of realize that we're all in this together, that no one has any more exposure than anybody else in terms of what we're doing in the operating room. Um, last week I bought the staff lunch on two days to really kind of take their mind off of it and have them, even though they had a socially distance, they were able to eat lunch together and, and mingle and talk and have fun. Um, and I think, you know, people seeing you as the guy who's you know presumably a leader being calm it helps everybody else be calm if they see you panicking or losing control then they're obviously going to lose control i think the thing that everybody has struggled with is getting accurate getting appropriate ppe um, and i'm sure in some of your hospitals they've been taking n95 masks and locking them up i can tell you in our hospital people have stolen masks gloves um wipes it's just really disheartening but we've had to lock a lot of that stuff up and uh, making sure people have appropriate ppe knowing how to use it and discussing things that as they come through national uh societies such as the american college of surgeons the asa american Society of anesthesia the aorn and talking to people about that i think that all helps i think it's communication is the key communication and education okay that's great so what do you see as your biggest obstacle to maintaining the safety measures that have been implemented due to the coronavirus? I, you know, and this goes back to that last slide. I, my big fear is that once this has blown over, that people will become complacent again and they'll forget how diligent and focused they were during this process and they'll go back to their old ways. And that, I'm, I'm hoping that we can all learn how unknowingly we can transfer a disease that can wipe out an enormous amount of people without any real ill intent. It's just going about our lives. And if we look at that, in, even in terms of the operating room, people coming in and out and bringing things in and out and bringing um, staff members who come in with, th with things in their hands or vendors come in with unclean attire, if we if we can put all of this that we've learned from this into place in that it'd be fantastic and we can really have an impact on patient morbidity and mortality i think that that's my fear is that people are going to become complacent so i'm hoping that this will demonstrate you know once the threat is gone i fear people are going to say oh we're okay so that's why i think keeping up this level of vigilance is going to be so important I agree. So another question here is, when you say for intubation, extubation for 28 minutes, is that for all patients or just COVID pos positive or potential? That's for all patients. So, you know, part of, I'm sure as we have all been a part of this educational process with this virus, you know, 
a lot of patients can shed the virus before coming, becoming symptomatic. And that shedding process can be anywhere from two to 14 days. And I think, you know, we, I'm sure you all have patients in your hospital who's, if you track their capacity to have this infection back, some people are struggling to figure out how or where they were exposed. So we, the measure we placed was simply, it was every single case rather than patients under investigation, as they call it, PUI or COVID positive. Okay, so how successful have you been in getting staff and surgeons to avoid bringing personal items into the OR? And, and what studies do you reference when asked for this information? So anybody who has that, anybody who has those questions specifically in the studies, I can provide those to you, so I have them. Um, and a lot of those studies, one of the studies was, one of the hallmark studies was done by the American Society of Anesthesia, ASA, and they, it wasn't really a study, it was more of a questionnaire. They sent out anonymous surveys to anesthesiologists and nurse anesthetists in reference to what they brought into the operating room. You'd be shocked at the number of people who admitted to bringing food, to drinking soda, coffee in the operating room. In terms of cell phone use, it's almost ubiquitous. I mean, anesthesia, they were, that number was frightening. But there are other studies which demonstrate that things like um, laryngoscopes, and some hospitals have all disposable laryngoscopes now, laryngoscopes, cell phones. Um, another big study referenced specifically teddy bears that children bring in when they have uh, procedures done. All this stuff is colonized with bacteria. And I have that information if anybody wants to see it. Okay, that's great. And as you can see on the screen, John's uh, email address is there. So as he said, if you want to contact him for any of this information, please go ahead. Um, okay, another question I've got is, do you have plans for restarting elective cases? And if so, any idea when that may happen? I, everyone asks me this question. If I, I honestly, I, I just, uh, during this, I looked at my phone, I had three texts from surgeons. So we had started the no strict no elective cases, which was anticipated to be a two week period. And this corresponded with what was in the expectation of a surge in cases. And I will admit that during that, during this, this would be the first week, full week, we have had an increase in the number of cases, both patients under investigation and patients requiring ICU support. So that has happened. Um, so the goal was to have that the strict no elective cases be a two week window. Um, and I'm hoping, you know, everybody asks, I just have no guidance. You know, my hope is that by the end of April, we're gonna be able to start resuming some level of elective cases, but that, you know, as all of you out there who have been a part of this know, the guidance changes so frequently and is so dynamic that I'm not pinning any hopes on that. But my hope would be the last week of April, first week of May. But that's certainly, I told all my staff and all my surgeons, don't take that as gospel. One of our orthopedic groups has canceled all cases until June, all elective cases. So that gives you an idea. Wow. Okay, we've got time for one more question is that um do you believe an ante room is of value in the or i'm sorry could you repeat that linda what type of room anti is a n t e a n t ante room um i i'm not for what do they do they have any other specifics in reference to that no it's do, do you believe in it is a value in the or um if that person who asked that question could give me more specific you put it in context for me um, i might be able to help out with that okay well um i can always pass oh oh someone else has had is that she thinks it might mean a, a sub sterile room does that make more sense well i just i love google so i googled it because i don't um the anti <laughs> <laughs> the ante room, also called ante room or ante chamber, is an area in close proximity to the clean room where technicians support perform support tasks. Yeah, we um, we have an ante room. The the staff goes in there all the time. I didn't know that was what it's called. Um, the staff goes in there all the time to kind of, to clean, grossly clean some equipment, to put enzyme on some equipment and stuff like that. The question is, do they need an ante room? 
Yes. Yeah, well, here's the issue. If you don't have the ante room, I didn't know it was called that. Thank you for educating me. Um, you know, I and I'm sure we've all seen this. You'll walk up to a scrub sink and something will be in that sink. And every time I look at something in that sink, I say to myself, wait a second. If I turn the sink on and the water now becomes aerosol and whatever's in that sink now becomes an aerosol and it's on my hands, it doesn't seem right. So we've seen people put equipment dirty equipment, which isn't grossly dirty, but was used on a patient in a scrub sink. I'm sure we all have, and I'm not a fan of that at all. So most of that stuff goes to the ante room where it's treated appropriately. So, you know, emptying a, an irrigation bag into the scrub sink is one thing, but putting grossly contaminated material in the scrub sink, I think, and then it becomes aerosolized, I think is not good. I don't like that at all. Okay. So one more question i think uh, any thoughts around forced air warming with air movement you know it's funny that question somebody just uh somebody just asked me that question today and i don't i don't know the i'm going to be honest and concede i don't know the answer um you know i think that that's a really difficult question to answer and uh, to and I'm going to go off topic a little bit to give you an idea, you know, the, the American, the Pennsylvania Dental Society, I'm from Pennsylvania, was going to make all dentists have negative pressure rooms to practice dentistry going forward, which to me seemed almost unimaginable because we don't have that many negative pressure rooms in the hospital. So when you talk about airflow in or out or forced air or air removed, um, I think that's just a really hard question to answer. I think the negative, you know, the negative error for the COVID room and all of our ORs having positive uh, pressure is clearly the standard, but some of the specifics of this, and I don't know if it matters. You know, the, we know the virus can travel six feet. Um, if you maintain six feet and you have PPE on, I don't know, does it, does it matter? Uh, as you travel through the rest of the hospital, there's none of that special ventilation. So I, I, don't, I don't know the answer. Okay, well, we've got time just for, I'm going to squeeze one more question in. Are you testing PTs prior to OR cases? P, PT, physical PTs, PATs yeah. you mean? PT, PT apostrophe S prior to OR, an OR case. Oh, patients, hang on. <laughs> Are you testing patients prior to OR cases? Yeah, sorry. Um, so we are, we are, well, we're not. So remember, there's no elective cases now. So anybody who's having surgery is having an emergency. But if you're asking, are we testing patients to determine if they have coronavirus, if they're positive or not, we are not. So everyone, you know, if they're a patient who comes in and they're highly suspect or they're a patient under interest, then everybody knows that patient. Um, and is, you know, they, they don their garb and wear the appropriate material. But if that isn't a patient under interest um, or a high risk patient, then no, we're, you know, those patients aren't being tested. So there's no universal testing for patients entering the operating room. Okay, that's good. Well, you can tell I'm not a nurse, can't you? So <laughs> that's why I, I stick to webinars, so. <laughs> that's the hard thing, I can see, I know. Okay, well, we've come up to our hour now. So thank you, John, for an informative and really thought-provoking webinar. And obviously, thank you again to our sponsor, Rep Scrubs. Uh, just a reminder that the post-webinar survey and certificate process is automated. So the survey link will be included in the follow-up email, which you'll receive in about an hour's time. Once you've completed the survey, you'll be able to download your certificate. If you have any questions, please contact us at webinar at mdpublishing.com and for more information on our upcoming OR well, Today webinars or even to watch uh, any of John's previous webinars please visit our website ortoday.com. Thank you all once again for joining us today and thank you for everything you do and are doing at the moment. We all truly appreciate you. Please stay safe from all of us here at OR Today and MD Publishing. Until next time, stay safe. Thank you Linda, my pleasure. Thank